Good evening, witches, warlocks, sorcerers, adepts, friends, fans, family, and followers to Season 3, Episode 2 of Knights of the Nephilim Radio Show, brought to you by Brutal Business Entertainment and Celestial Oddities Radio, bringing you 100% real and raw underground entertainment. As always, I will be your host and guide on this obscure and mysterious journey into magic and mysticism, darkness and divination. I am Reverend Freighter Crow of the Coterie of Samil Arcana Cult Order, and I am pleased to have you listening tonight. Whether you are listening live, streaming after the fact, or you've downloaded this to your device for on the go, thank you for your patronage and support. But by clicking the like, share, and follow button on whatever platform you are tuning in from, whether it be iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Deezer, Spreaker, CastBox, Google Play, Amazon Podcasts, or any of the other platforms in between that I might have missed, that is absolutely fine. Listen where you feel most comfortable. But by clicking those buttons, it moves us up the podcast community rankings, allows more people to discover the show, keeps you in the loop with new episodes as they air, and it gives you unfiltered access to our past archives. And folks, there's something for absolutely everyone out there. Whether it be this show here, Knights of the Nephilim, based upon esoteric science, occult doctrine, and ritual magic, or it be one of our other two shows, Celestial Oddities, The Pong, Pair of Normal Guys podcast, based upon paranormal and supernatural phenomena, interviewing professionals within that field, and taking phone calls from around the world to listen to listeners just like you about your phenomenal experiences with the unexplained, or our last show, Uncovering the Underground, where we interview underground artists from music to modeling to stars of the big screen, comedy, oddities, and everything in between. We give you absolutely everything you could want in underground entertainment here through Brutal Business Entertainment and Celestial Oddities Radio. So if you missed anything in our past episodes of this season or any of our past episodes of any of our other seasons or shows, make sure you jump back and check it out. If you know anybody that would love this show that maybe don't know about it, make sure you share it with them. Always bring on new people because there's a lot of information, a lot of great guests, and we share you know just a lot of breadcrumbs to help lead you to your path of a you know spiritual ascension. So you know certainly help spread the show around. If you have any suggestions of what you want to see us do, do differently. Any guests you have suggestions of we bringing on the show maybe next season, you can drop us a line at celestialoddities at gmail.com. Again, that's celestialoddities at gmail.com. You can message us on the Knights of the Nephilim Facebook page or on the Freighter Crow Facebook page, which is my personal Facebook page. We will always get back to you right away. We love hearing your suggestions. And lastly, before we get started this evening, I would suggest, as I mentioned earlier, you can listen anywhere that you please. But if you go through Spreaker, which is S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, so like speaker with an R, you can do that through the Spreaker app on the app market or through Spreaker.com. That will allow you not only to listen to the show, but also allows you to give your input throughout the show. There is an instant messenger feature where you can ask our guests each week questions, you can, you know, just involve yourself in the show. I read those comments and those questions out throughout. So if you would like to get involved, please do. We always suggest it. Suggest it. And then uh, lastly, we air a show to you for this specific show every other Thursday night, 8.30 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the weeks in between, we have our other show, Celestial Oddities, 8.30 to 10, or 10 o'clock p.m. Staggered back and forth. So Every week you're getting something, um, but it's always on cross weeks. So this week, two weeks from now, two weeks further. So follow the schedule if you want to see great guests, which we certainly have this evening. Before I jump into our guest this evening, we would like to thank our sponsors, the Aragni Arcane Services, Belladonna Botanicals, the Telemancer, Goetic Impressions, and Limitless Liberation. We will go into detail on who these companies are, what they do, where you can check them out, and give you promo codes if we have one, so that you can check out their wares and pick something up for yourself today, and we'll do that throughout the episode. Now this evening, I'm very excited. I know this is a very highly anticipated episode uh, here for you know episode two, and we have James Udung, who also goes by The Illumin Ra author of Hoodoo Grave uh, Yard Sorcery, Hoodoo Mojo Bags and Baby Dolls, and Hoodoo Crossroads Conjure Sorcery. 
He is an Ifa priest, also goes by Babaleo, which is what they call the priest there, of the Uriba Ifa Orisha tradition, and a priest of African tradition witchcraft. A professional sorcerer, magi, and a student of nature. Someone I certainly respect and look up to. He has wonderful courses and teaches hundreds and thousands of people across the world how to get into talismanic hoodoo, mixing elements of the grimoires to elements of hoodoo and bringing something very, very powerful. Um, and his advice, his, his knowledge is certainly cherished in the occult scene. I have gone to this man for personal workings myself and gotten wonderful results, and I stand by him. As I told everyone last episode, there will never be anybody else on this show again that I don't personally resonate with and look up to. In the past, I had had guests on because of popularity and because of fan requests. There were people I didn't really feel were true in what they do, but that's what the fans wanted. There will never be that again because this show is only on the fact of giving you those seeds of knowledge. And that's what we're going to do this evening. So without further ado, grab your athames, put on your ceremonial attire, Light your candles and focus your desire. Step into the circle. Intone the sacred names. Give offering and praise as you stare into the flames. And we summon the spirit that is the Illumin Ra. Folks, welcome to the show this evening. We are very excited to have our guest on, as I announced prior to that little song break there. We have De Illumin Ra, and someone who is an expert in his field. And I wanted to make a side note real quick before I bring him on. He is calling in this evening, or with us this evening, the whole way from Eket, which is a uh, one of the largest cities in Akwa Ibom State of Nigeria, which is a northeastern um, or northwestern uh, Africa. So he is, he is coming from a long ways away this evening. I think it's like 3 o'clock in the morning there. So this just shows this man's dedication to his craft and to wanting to teach each and every one of you. So make sure you listen and jot down notes because we got some great stuff for you this evening. Brother, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here, but Absolutely. It's something we wanted to do for for a while now, and we were able to bring it to the light and you know bring it to the fans, and I'm very excited because we have a lot of fun stuff to unpack this evening. Sure. So I like to start some of the shows traditional. Um, you know, you haven't been on the show before, so like last week I didn't do it because Thomas Leroy had, um, but we will do it how I normally do when I have a new guest. I would like you to start with telling us how you got into the field of the occult and into the field of magic. Now, you have something a little bit different than most people have because you come from a lineage and a tradition, um, whereas most people that I talk to were kind of one-offs where at some point in their life, usually not taught down to them generational, they just got into the occult. Um, and that is a little bit different with your heritage. So I would like you to explain and, and tell everyone more about yourself and how you got into this lifestyle and became who you are today. All right. It's a pleasure to actually, uh, for the first time in a large scale bit, explain who I am, how my journey has begun, and how it got me here. <laughs> All right, I am actually, as I've already said, I am James Odum, 
from Africa here in Nigeria, uh, precisely. I come from a royal family, and we had a tra- we have a tradition in in that family, and I was born and breeding in such tradition, and that tradition is a little bit mixed within the. Uh, local tradition, the African tradition, and a little bit of the Englishman's tradition, which my father happens to be uh, a Jehovah's Witness <laughs> at some dark time. You know, funny enough. So, uh, as I grew up, around uh, seven years thereabout, I developed more interest into the things of the invisible, the things of the spirit. <laughs> I feel like I'm being called to understand what the spiritual world is all about. So I keep, you know, moving away from the Jehovah's Witnesses teachings gradually, you know, because it wasn't really my thing. It wasn't really my call. Then I had an uncle, an elder brother of my father, who happened to be uh, the priest of the African traditional witchcraft in my home community. And then I continue to go closer to him, go closer to him. And then he threw more light, you know, into the realms of the spirit for me. It became more interesting. So that's how my journey began. So one way or the other, I left Jehovah's Witnesses and focus on the traditional system of my phobias. That's interesting. I mean, you know... And I think for a lot of us, that is something similar where we started out in one path where it just, for some reason, it's not that we're necessarily against it, but it just didn't resonate or feel like the correct path we were supposed to be on. And I know a lot of my guests say of similar, you know, similar stories, a lot of times, you know, they're coming from a Christian or a Catholic background and they say, you know what, for some reason... I did not resonate with that, whether they're completely against those religions and it's it's a complete rebellion, or it's not that they're against it, but for some reason the exact teachings seemed a little skewed, and they have to step outside of that to find those seed corns of truth. That usually is something all occultists share, is that we started one place and kind of altered and shifted into another. Yeah, so my, my own story, it's more like my father in law was the only person in the family, in the larger family, the royal family, that actually did not worship, like, due to my mother, because my mother was a witness through the father. So my father was the only person that was out of a family, of the family tradition. But outside that, every other person in the family, we, we actually practice the African tradition, you know, and we have healers. As a matter of fact, my father's mother, by name uh, Ros- Rosina, is actually uh, a diviner. She can see beyond the ordinary things of life. She could stay in the spirit world for three days without you know, being in the physical body, like being in the physical uh, activities of life. So we actually, I actually came from a, tra- a family, a tradition, that has a root, you know, and even till death, we still prefix it. So I actually wanted to prefix in my own uh, uh, phobia tradition instead of prefixing in another tradition that my dad, due to love or something, <laughs> you know, get engaged into. Now, how was that, though, having people within your family that, that practiced traditional magic and traditional divination um, because one thing, you know, when you have masters of the Afa tradition, that's one thing that always comes up when you do any research or look into it is the fact that there are master diviners and it's a very unique form of divination different than using the tarot cards, different than using scrying mirrors. Why don't you tell us a little bit more on how that works? Because I think a lot of our listeners out there, when they think of divination or diviners, they're thinking of the classic, not I want to say classic, but the common forms of divination, but they're not thinking of divination in the sense that you are bringing it up. So can you explain 
how it is that, you know, followers of the Ifa tradition use divination. All right. Uh, I'll come from my, the African traditional witchcraft. Mind you, when I'm talking about the African traditional witchcraft, uh, it is an expansive tradition, a very expanded tradition. It is actually what Ifa is also. But if I is a tradition of the Yoruba people, mind you, I am not an Yoruba man. You understand? Now, I come from a different region in Nigeria that is a bit different from Yoruba. But although I also have a link, an ancestral link with the Yoruba, tra- with the Yoruba uh, culture and the Yoruba uh, land, I have a link back from my history, the history of how my people come about. We have a common uh, ancestral link. So that's a cycle for now. Now, when I'm talking about African traditional witchcraft here, I want to differentiate something here. I'm not talking about Ifa. I say I'm talking about, because even in Ifa, we have this aspect of uh, witchcraft that I'm talking about. We'll, we'll go that, into that a, a little bit later on. So I'm talking about the culture of my family, of my land, of my environment, specifically. I come from a place called Andoni in Obolo. You, you know, the, the, the ethnic group there is called Obolo. That is O-B-O-L-O, Obolo. Now, that is the, that is the tradition I'm actually talking about right now. We're talking about spirit divination here, not tarot card, not... Uh, spine mirrors and stuff like that. No. The spirit divination here is when you actually call forth the spirit, there are times you consciously call forth the spirit by giving it liquors like, you know, offering some rums and stuff like that, you know, to call forth the attention of the spirit. And then the spirit will come on its own and descend upon the priest or the priestess that he choose to work with. Now, when the spirit is saved, like what we call spirit possession, and possesses this person, this person, in other words, speaks the voice of the spirit, not his or her own voice. So it's speaking what the spirit is saying, what the spirit is actually saying through him or her. That is the divination we usually use here in our tradition. That's interesting. So it's a bit different from uh, tarot card and whatnot. I think that's more honestly. That's I don't want to say any form is better than another form, but I say that that's a direct form. And I mean, I, I like that because that is hands-on, direct connection with spirit. Um, and a lot of people, you know, from the states are afraid. And I, I'm not saying everyone, but there's a lot of people that are afraid to take that step of any type of, of letting a spirit within, doing any type of self-possession. But if you are a powerful medium of any sort, that is one of the best ways of communicating and one of, of you know the clearest forms of communication, whether it be um, just communication or it be divination. Um, so that is very interesting, and I'm sure very powerful to witness. Um, I know I've actually done self-possession on myself and I know it from a standpoint of experiencing it, but I am a solo practitioner, so I'm not usually ever practicing with anybody else, but I felt what it's like to have something take over and communicate through me, but to watch someone else do, it's not something I normally see. So that, that is interesting. Yeah. It's usually common around here when, you know, we, when the spirit gets you possessed, we understand that this time around that you have been taken over by the spirit. Now, it depends on what the spirit wants to say. The spirit usually would not last more than an hour or two on a usual content. But depending on the message the spirit is trying to pass, depending on the level of understanding, people are trying to understand what the spirit is saying. The spirit can last even up to three days, but not more than that. Wow. That means the person will be in will be possessed for three days, will be speaking constantly whatever the spirit wants he or she to speak. So it is a bit uh, very high level of a divination, yes. And then at the same time, it is not dangerous as people think it is. It is not. Because at the same time, the spirit will automatically leave the body when it chooses to. And if 
uh, let's say, people around there, because there, there will usually be people around the possessed person, the, the, tra- the practitioners will give some libations and then there are things they would do. There are some, some certain leaves they will put in the water and sprinkle the possessed person, then make some libation. The spirit will automatically leave the person at that point in time. So it is not as it is not uh, dangerous or so uh, fearsome as people think it is. Well, and I think there's like a, a stigma or a taboo that that people put on it, and that's partially because of of you know modern pop culture trying to add spins to things and make it spooky. I mean, even the occult in general, when an average person hears that and has no understanding of what arcane knowledge is and the practices, it seems so dark and gloomy to them. It's all bad, but they don't realize there's a million different paths within that umbrella of things. And that really it's, it's not near as dark as they want to think it is. It can be depends upon your practice, but just like you said, with self possession, it's not something that is going to, destroy you and not not normally at least and it's something that will leave or can be forced to leave if need be yeah it's just funny that you have a lot that that they go off of what they've heard their whole life and it's like once you decide to start taking this path folks you need to wipe the slate of everything you've ever believed prior to that day away and then start learning for yourself from your own experiences and from what resonates with you and grow from there. Don't bring any baggage of what you've learned prior to that coming in or a preconceived notion because you're setting yourself up for failure and setting yourself up for a lot of years of mishaps and, and, and rituals that don't seem to work because your mindset is not where it needs to be to make the magic work properly. We have a comment coming in here. We have, uh, please tell Master Ra brightest blessings to him from Willie Conjure in New York City. <laughs> well, thank you, Willie. Willie Conjure, I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Much love to you, brother. Um, and thank you to everybody else listening out there as well. We have uh, a couple other comments coming in saying hello to everyone. So hello, everyone. Um, no, that's fascinating. And I definitely I definitely resonate, though I, I, I've never followed you know, any of the African traditional paths, I've always had a massive respect because I feel and have said time and time again that there is really no stronger magic um, than than African magic. And no matter what kind of form you're going with, most, I feel, beat out what Western magic has become and what it's really always been. But there's a lot of watered-down applications and rituals and knowledge here that I think a lot of people are really far from where they need to be. And anything I've ever witnessed or studied, um, and then even your courses, I had taken your courses, I have not worked the magic yet. It's something that I told myself I would not work your course until I was perfectly ready mentally to take that on and to step aside from my normal practices. I have my own daily practice, my own daily discipline. But I said, you know what? Once I decide to, to step into the Solomonic conjure lessons that you give, I am going to step away from my own path for a chunk of time and focus solely on that and dive in. And I look forward to doing that. I haven't made that step yet. But I'm anxious to do so because I know the power that's in it. And when I watch your postings, I watch your knowledge that you share, I'm like, man, he is connected at a different level. Now, what do we else got? We have a couple other comments of people just talking back and forth here. Okay, so why don't you tell us? In fact, since I just brought that up, it'd be a great way to segue into that. You have come up with a conjure course um, of Hoodoo Solomonic magic can you tell us how you came into you know bringing this together as a course and as a teaching in a way to bring these two streams of magic into one and start getting it to the public and teaching people this wonderful magic can you explain that to us all right i i would i would definitely do that (laughs) um when i started practicing traditional witchcraft uh, graphics here, I saw a lot of elements that is also in hoodoo, you know, 
is the ones that is circulated out there. Hoodoo, there is a surface of hoodoo, and there is a deeper part of hoodoo. So the surface is what is what is usually shared in books and stuff like that, online and whatnot. Then the deeper part of hoodoo is also there that you will not really see in books. So I decided to like bring my knowledge to the surface. I studied Solomonic magic for about uh, 10 to 12 years of the about. And then I understand the fundamentals of Solomonic rites. I was also engaged into uh, the GD, that is the Golden Dawn Prathics and whatnot. So I decided to bring these elements and join them together so I can have an easy prathics that I can be doing on a daily basis. Why did I do that? Because it will be a bit hard for me, practicing Solomonic magic alone, practicing Hoodoo alone, and whatnot. So I try to mesh the both prathics a little bit into each other and see how it goes and see what I can achieve out of it. And when I must tell you, I have achieved lots and lots of results from you know doing that. It has become so easy for me to do it. It has become part of my life, a daily practice and all of that. And it's powerful. I mean, like I said, everything I've watched and how you've brought those two streams together, as you said, it brings you a kind of a sense of Solomonic magic, yet Golden Dawn feel slash hoodoo feel. It's this culmination of, of these powerful streams to come together to form something altogether unique in itself. But from what I've read of your course, I like to I like to read over the course material, really absorb what it is I'm getting into, and, and then vibe with that and meditate and focus on that. And I felt the power from it. I'm like, oh, wow. And that's why I was originally going to start your course a while back when I got it. And I said, you know what? I'm not starting this right now because if I don't have the proper amount of time to put into this, it's not worth starting right now. You wait until you do. And that's exactly what I've done. So I've read the course material. I can see where it's going. I can see what's possible with it. But I said, you know what? This in itself, as you said, can be a daily practice and can be your life's practice. And I'm like, well, how do I work this into what I'm already doing? And I'm like, well, it has to reach a point where I step aside from what I'm doing and step into this for a while and see what happens, see what I get from that. Let's see here. The computer's doing something weird tonight, folks. I keep getting what says a new message coming in, someone like asking a question, but when I look, there's nothing there. So I don't know. If you're trying to message us out there and, and ask uh, a question, I apologize we are not seeing it, but it keeps beeping that something's coming in and nothing's showing up. Now, one of the main things that we wanted to talk about tonight, which could be, you know, could be fitting to the Solomonic path, would be... When people think of Solomonic magic, they think of ritual circles, they think of triangles of manifestation, they think of all the ins and outs and the complexities of Solomonic magic. But what happens is is in the last 10 years, last 15 years, there's been a grimoire renaissance of, of just explosion of everybody wanting to jump into the grimoires, and everybody wanting to jump into the Lamegaton and the Gaboetia and in and, and the same books. And the problem is... It seems like people don't have a a true and strong understanding of what some of the things within these rituals are for. Hence, the ritual circle. So many times over the years, I've heard people talk about ritual circles being for protection, which they can be. I've heard people talk about them being for this or for that. Oh, I don't need a circle. I don't use them. I don't need anything to barricade me from the spirit. We're on a great terms with one another and, you know, talking like they're old friends. And you hear so many different ins and outs of people talking. And even when they say it's for protection, they don't seem to fully understand how that works or why that would work. But there's a layer, folks, beyond it being for protection and beyond it being just a visual necessity of the ritual but rather it being your vehicle to launch you into the ritual and be your sacred space now i would love to hear from delamine ra uh on, on his take on this because he uses a ritual circle as do i and i want to apologize to anyone listening out there because as i told you last episode 
there was blinds I put up in some of the past episodes as well. As I said, there were some people that were on my show that weren't real practitioners. They don't practice magic. They only pretend to practice magic. And I would mess with some of them. And I don't do that anymore because I only have people I respect and I don't mess with people I respect. But I would say things like, oh, I don't use a ritual circle either. And I don't ever use angelic names. And I don't do any of these things. And, oh, I don't need protection. And say the same things that they were saying to have them agree and be like, oh, yeah. you know, we, 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 Just to really see how far they would take it. But, folks, within a, you know, the same type of episodes, a week later, I would post a ritual and I would be in a ritual circle. And no one ever really called me out on that and said, wait a second, last episode you said you don't ever use ritual circles, but then you just posted a picture of you using a ritual circle. I did that on purpose. I've always used a circle. I will always use a circle. Um, so there was some blinds I put into some of the shows and just messed with some of my guests to see if they, any of them would call me out and say, oh, no, you should use it for this reason. And none of them did except ones who actually perform magic and, and they knew better. So can you explain to us, brother, how using a circle – can set up your sphere of sensation and can be your vehicle to launch you further into your trance-like states and further into your conjuring. Can you tell us from your perspective why that is vital and how that works? All right. It's a, it's a simple thing. But first, we need to really understand what a magical cycle really is. That way we'll be able to understand that it is beyond just the perfection level. And it could also be a, a portal, a doorway to the spiritual world, you know, bringing the spirit down and also ascending into the spirit world. It is a doorway between these two worlds, or the physical and the spiritual. So now the, the magic cycle, it's, it's a sacred ground, not just a sacred ground, but a purified sacred ground. You know, where you carry out your rituals, your spell works, your ceremonies and whatnot, you know, it becomes a psychic boundary. You know, it offers you a psychic boundary. You know, for a reservoir of, you know, a concentrated power. If the power you, you raise within the cycle, the power that comes, you know, while doing your invocations and invocations, you know, it try to concentrate this power within one place. It gives you that sense that this is a holy place. This is what you're doing here. It keeps you focused on what you want to do. By giving you that focus, that concentration, it pulls you mentally and otherwise into the realm of the spirit. It changes your mindset that you're not just in the ordinary world, that you are in the realm of the spirit. You're in between the threshold of the spirit and the visible. So that's what a magical cycle really is. It offers you that perfection, no doubt, from uh, negative forces and from um, outside influences, you know, outside disturbance and whatnot. At the same time, it makes you a god. Look at the same, the uh, uh, magical circle given in the uh, in the key of Solomon. You will see at the center written master, that is the professional, of the, 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 the master of, the, of the, the appraisal, you know, like the master magician. Now, it is not just master here. The master, to me, I understand it to be that you are a god. You're speaking as a god. That is why you have the authority to command spirits and they will pay obedience unto you. You speak with authority and you cannot apologize to any being because you are God. That is the sense what mag the magical cycle brings to you know, the play. The magical cycle is like bringing the vis invisible world to the visible world. That is how I see it. So you are literally standing in the invisible world, but in the visible world, performing your rituals. So it, 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 I, I will use these, uh, these terms. The magical cycle is like an insulator around the cable. You know, it guides you from the currents that flows in the conductor, like the, 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 the naked wire or something. It guides you against, you know, touching it directly and getting shocked. That is it. The, the conductor here is the spirit. The insulator is a circle that guides you, the electrician, from the current. At the same time, you can still be walking on the current, but you are safe. That is how I see it. Then, I also see magical circle as a beautiful room, like your bedroom. 
fully painted, well furnished, and you know, garnished and whatnot. And then you have a visitor coming in. You can either decide to close off the visitor at the door or to allow the visitor to come in. That is perfection. At the same time, outside the perfection, it gives you a cozy environment to relax. It gives, it gives your visitor also a cozy environment to relax and feel comfortable. When your visitor is at the door post, it, not yet in the room, like the room is a magical cycle here. The magical cycle can be termed also to be like a, a, a mini temple. You understand? Now, the, 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 the visitor at the door looks into your room See how beautiful it is. Because of the beauty of your room, there's the, the fragrance, you know, that comes out from your room and whatnot. The light works and all, all of that. The visitor becomes more relaxed, more calm, and it's overtaken by those beautiful things. Those beautiful things in the, in the realm of magic, here it's the names of God, the divine names, names of the spirits and whatnot that is written around this circle. It keeps the, uh, the spirit attention focus that here is beautiful, here is where I can be. It, it, you know, it keeps the spirit, uh, it gives the spirit a cozy environment to continue to focus and pay attention to you while you speak. So it has a lot of ways, you know. The magical cycle has a lot of functions beyond uh, magical right, rituals and stuff. You could actually create a magical cycle just to meditate. Just to you know, project yourself into the realm of the spirit, and this will trigger it faster. The magical cycle represents a wholeness. It represents the cosmos. It represents perfection, unity. You know, it, it creates you know the invisible in the visible. That's how I see it. Well, it does, and I love some of the in, things in this, you said. In this cycle, in this cycle, you you transcend beyond the physical nature. You know. And you, your mind will be open to a more deeper level of consciousness while you're in the circle. That is the reason why you can communicate easily or understand what the Spirit is saying. Well, you mentioned several very important things there. I mean, as you said, in, in the middle of the circle, the Solomonic circle, it does say master because you are taking on the role of the master of this operation. And around you, it says alpha at omega, the beginning and the end. Yeah. You are taking on the role of of God or a God of that operation. Now, I love that because most people don't understand that. Oh, I don't need a circle. You're lacking because... That circle gives you a defined area. Look at also like the macrocosm and microcosm. You are now taking control of of that as master. And as you said, the names and the holy names of God, people often on the left-hand path, let's use this as an example, will say, I don't use the names of God or angels. That's disrespectful to the demons that I'm working with. What you don't realize is it's not. It's not actually disrespectful at all. And as was just discussed, it actually gives them an area that they come to and they see names that they recognize and they see names that, as as was discussed, make them feel comfortable to be there in this temple. The incense smoke, the lighting, the atmosphere. And it allows you to feel them on the outskirts of that circle. Many times in ritual, I have been deep in my work and you're looking forward, and maybe the spiritual presence isn't in front of you, and it comes from behind. And all of a sudden, you feel the presence on the outskirts of the circle just behind your shoulder. And it allows you as a detector to know that they are here. And then it gives you that defined place. And, and as, as James said, you know, it, 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 it's the conduit for that energy to come into into you and to you to work with. And I loved your example of you of using electricity because that's how I've always really looked at spiritual currents as electricity. As you can work with it in the proper way and use the proper equipment and focus and work with it safely and you can light a house with it. You can do all these amazing things with electricity, but let's not be ignorant folks and think that it's not dangerous. If you handle electricity improperly, you will be killed or injured at best. But if you do it properly, you can channel that electricity, that current, that energy, and work with it. And that's what these things do. 
is by having the ritual circle. Another thing that I've explained on past shows or to other people just in general is look at it from a lens of chemistry. People will say, I don't use angelic names or ritual circles, this or that. You can work with a volatile substance time and time again and not have it explode on you and still get the result that you're looking for, all the meanwhile risking yourself. But if you have agents or chemicals sitting there that you know once mixed will give you a just as good of a result, if not a better one, but stabilize the mixture from being so volatile, why would you not use it? It's like, oh, I don't mix in the chemical that protects me because it's disrespectful to the other chemical. They don't care, folks. That's not how it works. Um, there's this this taboo, like I said, that when you're an ooky, spooky, dark left-hand path practitioner, that there's like everything is either the god or the devil. Everything's good or bad. And that is a really really messed up way to look at magic. Yes, there is dualities in magic, of course, but not in the lens that most people believe, at least in the Western sense of how it works, that angels don't work with demons and God names shouldn't be used in invocations of demonic spirits. No, that's, that's not true. In fact, by using them, you will have a stronger experience. Doesn't mean that you have to throw their sigil in a box and hold it over an open flame that it says in some of the, some of the parts of the lesser key of Solomon. You don't have to do that if you don't choose to. But by using the circle, by using the God names, you enhance your potency of your ritual outcome. And I don't know, folks, about you, but when I do something, I want to do it well, and I want to have a great result. So if you can conjure a spirit and get 10% of the potency of that spirit, or you can get 90% of the potency of that spirit, which one do you want? I'm going for the 90 and that's why we use ritual <laughs> circles. So that's my take on it, yeah. you know, and uh, I, I think that's really let me, let me, resonates. Let me, uh, let me add something here. Please do. That is the way I see sacral too. You know, looking at God names, spirit names, and all of that, symbols, seals, and sigils around the sacral. These are not just like names. These are beings. These are like human beings, if I may use that term. <laughs> Now imagine that you have you're a commander of the armed force, and then you have about uh, twenty armies or fifty around you, and then you're facing one one single army or so to speak. You're speaking and giving authority to a single being or a single army, and then you're a commander with about fifty people around you. Don't you think they will give you more respect? The single army will give you more respect. Absolutely. It will give you more respect because of the people around you. He will not want to attack you because he know he cannot beat you because you have 50 people around you. Like if you just said, this is what you want to happen, that's what will happen. So that is how a ritual cycle is. The names, the seals, and all of that, they are actual beings. They are spiritual beings. That sometimes we can't see with our visible eyes, but they are there. Once the circle is activated, that's why you purify the grounds, you recite psalms, you know, you do a lot of conjurations even before you actually do the main oppression. You know, you do a lot of prayers and all of that. You are doing all of this to awaken the names, to awaken the symbols. You know that, that they become a being, a, you know, a spiritual being. In the invisible world. So when the spirit comes, he's, he's seeing a battalions of forces around you. He would not want to attack you, but want to work with you. But at the same time, do not misuse the opportunity of having lots of spiritual beings around you. Because if you step beyond your boundaries, you will also get hot. I like that. No, that's very strong. And I mean, that, that goes on to another point of showing your strength when doing rituals. Something I, I see a lot of people do or talk about is that when they, they do call forth a spirit to work with, they're either groveling at that spirit's feet or talking to it like it's their buddy down the street. And neither of which I find to be an appropriate measure of working with a spirit. You don't have to be ignorant, but you come with dominance and talk 
so that you are respected. And as Master Raja said, you are using the names to show your dominance. When you have these armies around you, these spiritual forces around you, and the spirit that you conjure shows, it is now showing respect for you, knows that you mean business, know that you have strength, know that you're taking the time and preparation to do this operation properly to bring it forth, so therefore it respects that fact and works with you in a proper sense. If you do things haphazardly and sloppily and it shows up, it's going to know that you are not powerful, you are not well put together, and it might be very angry that you called it forth to our plane when it might not want to be here. Now you have no protections, you have no armies around you. And a lot of times what I see people doing is they talk very weakly, oh, thank you for coming, great spirit, and they're talking to it like shakily and scared, and then you expect to get a result. You expect to tell the spirit, this current, to go forth and bring change in your microcosm or your macrocosm, and then it doesn't work, and you're like, well, I don't understand. I, I, you know, I thought we had a good relationship because it, it doesn't work like that, folks. You have to be stern. You have to stand as a soldier. Call them forward. Talk to them with respect, but also with dominance. Use the proper ways, and you will have proper results. Um, that's why I never understood yeah. Satanists and never understood. Um, a lot of left-hand path practitioners, Damon Alters and all these people, because there are some that practice properly, but there's so many that I just, I call forth the spirit and, you know, we're really close to one another and they always do what I say, you know, and they talk about them like they're friends and that, it's very cringeworthy to me. I'm not saying that you can't build a respect and a rapport with a spiritual current, but it's weird to me when I hear people talking about spiritual currents like they're, like they're friends and they're talking in a <laughs> and they're talking in a sense that this this spirit will never do me wrong. We're bodies, as we talked about earlier. You can look at working with spirits that same way as we used electricity. You're thinking yeah. your body, so you're like, I can just reach my hand into the breaker box and start grabbing circuits because electricity won't hurt me. We're friends. Try it out. See what happens. <laughs> you might get away with it once or twice, but eventually you're probably going to regret it. It's a uh, it is better to be on the safe side than not. And, you know, this brings, I, I hear you talk about how you communicate with spirit. Yeah, you're very correct. You would need to speak with an authority. And you don't just speak by making your voice, your voice a sound authoritative, no. But inside of you, you must limit every atom of fear. You must, you must remove every fragment of fear, every fragment of, of you know, uh, speaking like a weak man. You must speak authoritatively within and without. Your voice and the inside of your heart feels the same thing. It was a net together. That is only when the spirit will recognize that you are an authority. Because if you speak as an authority, then the spirit looks beyond your words into your heart and then sees that you are a baby inside. Then you're fucked up. Either I will not pay attention to you too long and will just get out. Or would just, you know, do whatever I choose to do with you. That's how it is. Now, it is like, uh, let me bring up this scenery here. Let, let me bring this picture here. The picture of you going to um, a lady, a beautiful dancer that is well equipped. Then you approach her to, you know, to talk to her, you know, you know talk to her into a relationship or whatever trying to get our attention. One, it is not all about your outfits, how you dress and whatnot. No. It is how you speak, the confidence that comes out from the voice, that oozes out from your voice, that she feels and respects. And you must not talk so commandingly, but you must talk, you know, as a man, but respectfully, just like you say. Then the lady in question will respect you and would give you attention, and probably you know things could happen from there. So that's how I see it. You must, you must, put, you must, you must, uh, you know, exhibit that level of confidence in and out, an authority, but in a respectful manner while you're communicating with spirit. So that's it. Well, that's it. I mean, I love how you 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 address that. That yeah, you can walk up to a girl. And even have, let's say, the ritual circle. So in this case, you can walk up to the girl with real nice clothes and, and real nice shoes on and everything. You look good. You're prepped. 
But if you have no authority behind you, and I don't mean being demanding, I mean just being confident in yourself, that woman's going to spot that within seconds. You might not have the shaky voice, but they're going to hear it. There's a, there's a resonance that comes from someone that's confident. When you meet someone that just walks around like they are the king of the world, but I don't mean in a sense that they're cocky. I mean that they just walk around and have that energy where you're like, wow, this person is a king of their life, a master of their domain. They have that confidence and they never need to raise their voice. It goes back to the you know the old saying that, the, the the most powerful one in the room is the one not talking. And the reason that that is is because when you have so much power and confidence within yourself, you don't need to tell others you do. You don't need to, to float it around to everyone. You just you you live and breathe it. It emanates from you. And that's the type of confidence and directness that you need in your ritual workings along with the other things that we discussed because they don't take away from it. They don't disrespect it. They amplify and enhance it and give you proper results. And it's weird that so many people nowadays will refer back to ancient tomes and grimoires. People these days will talk about Solomonic magic. They'll talk about the the Red Dragon. They'll talk about the Grim Grimoire and the Grimoire Virum and, and all these, you know, the Heptameron and all these books. And how they're so powerful and how I'm, oh, I love these books. But then they'll turn around in the same sentence and be like, yeah, I practice, I don't use any of that. Well, why are you always talking about books that you don't live from? If you're, if you're fascinating from these books, try the workings how the books say. If you're not going to try the workings how the books say, then find ways of doing magic without that. But it's really strange that there's like this disconnect that I talk to left-hand path practitioners that'll talk up and down about these grimoires and these magic but then they don't follow the formula within the books to do the magic. It's it's really strange. We have a question coming in here. Question for Master Ra. Here in the U.S., we generally don't use ritual circles in African-American hoodoo, but we do bless the ground, stomp the ground, and lay claim to the ground in the name of, and then it just dot, 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 whoever name you want to use, apparently, would you consider this to be a uh, sort of ritual circle or sort of ritual circle? Just was a typo. I do believe so. I first would like to answer before Master Rod does. I would say so. If you're blessing the ground, you're stomping the ground, and you're doing something within your mind to set up that perimeter, then you are formulating your sphere of sensation and your vehicle of operation. It is a little bit different than using a Solomonic circle with the God names and, and that power. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you different type of results, but it is still setting up your sacred space, and that is what's important. That is the key to it, in my opinion. You have to, you must, every operation, set up sacred space for yourself. That is Magic 101. That's the first thing you do when you come into your temple you, you prepare your temple. You have it ready for the operation. You've been thinking for it. You've been prepping. Myself, I'll take ritual salt baths. I'll come in in my specific ritual garb. And I come in and I sit down and I meditate and ground myself. And then the very next step is to set my sacred space, which in my case is a circle. But then I do certain operations to empower that circle before I do anything with trying to conjure or call forth anything. To me, that is the basics. And when you skip any of those steps right there, you're setting yourself up for failure. Once again, playing with electricity without the insulated gloves. You're just sticking the <laughs> stick in the in a screwdriver or the pliers right in there. And you're like, oh, we're gonna see what happens. So what's your opinion on that? All right. This is it. You you you've answered it, but I want to throw more lights to it. Uh, you already say sprinkling the grounds, calling upon names and stuff like that. Will that be viewed as a circle? The answer is a direct yes. That is a circle. Because if you look at the beginning of these, I, 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 I give a meaning, the, the meaning of a circle. What is a circle? A circle is a sacred ground, a sacred boundary, you know, away from the ordinary world. You know, it expands and extends through the worlds of men, into the astral planes, into the realms of the spirits. So now, 
That is what a typical circle represents. That's what a circle is. It is all about creating a sacred ground. It is all about expanding that visible world into a spiritual world. And then at the same time, creating a link within the physical and the spiritual. That's what circle does. It is bringing the spiritual to the physical and then merging them together. That is why in a specific tradition that I belong, when we draw a circle on the ground, like we usually literally use a sword to draw a train ring circle, we don't usually use uh, names like God's name and all of that. You know, it is actually an, uh, an ancient African tra- uh, power walking. There's a specific ritual we do usually at the graveyards or at the crossroad. We, tra- we draw a twin ring circle with uh, uh, either a sword or a, a staff, you know, around us. Then we draw a cross just at the four corners of the, the, um, uh, the circle. And we draw the same cross, an equal hand cross. Mind you, when I say cross here, it's not about Christianity and whatnot. So we draw an equal hand cross on the hay at the four corners of the cro- of the circle. This, to me, I believe, I understand it to be like the cross represents the the, the earth plane, the earth. The circle represents the spiritual plane. So we are merging the, we are bringing the earth, we are joining the earth to the spirit by drawing the cross on the hay. Then we are also creating the three ring circle around us to make to bring the the the, the, uh, the three dimensions of the invisible to the physical walking. So coming back to your explanation, doing all of that thing you're doing, sprinkling the water. Usually this is done in a circle, like you do, you do it in a, in a in a clockwise pattern or anti-clockwise pattern, but depending on what you want to actually carry out in the ritual. It is a circle that you're performing. You're not just sprinkling the water alone to purify the ground and create a boundary, but you're also calling upon forces, your ancestors, your spirit guides, the gods of the land and whatnot, the nature spirits and all of that, to guide it. We used to do it. It's in hoodoo. It's in African traditional witchcraft. It is right. It is a circle. Now, this brings me, if I've answered that, this brings me to another point, that circles are of different types. All circles are not the same. Let's go back to the Grimoire. The Grimoire has lots of circles, different, different, different nature of circles that are there in various Grimoires. There are some Grimoires that carries up to three, four, five different circles for different oppressions. Depending on the circle you're drawing, it depends on the energy you're invoking. It depends on the energy you want to link with. It depends on the forces you want to work with. Then God names and the spirit names and whatnot, the seals you use around the circle, is actually, um, it has to resonate with the force you want to invoke and the direction the force is coming from. So all of this is calculated into, because mind you, you are trying to create a spiritual world on the physical plane. So now, leaving the grimoire a bit and coming back to the tradition of our phobias, the African tradition, you know, the hoodoo, the voodoo, and whatnot. There are different ways of creating circles, like the salt circle. You could create salt, a circle with a salt, you know, a sea salt, or the ordinary everyday salt you use in our houses. Around yourself, it's going to give you perfection, because the salt is an element of air and water. It marries, if this, we know that water is related to the spiritual, and earth is, or you already know, the, the things of the visible world. So it gives you that same invisible and visible nature, merging together to create balance, to create perfection, to create wholeness. Now, there are also uh, circles like you could use called like a rope to create around yourself. Mind you, if you want to do this, people just said use a rope around yourself. But I don't say, I don't usually advise on that. If you want to use a specific rope, you must bless the rope. It's not an everyday rope that you just put around yourself and believe it's going to give you a circle because it becomes a, a circle on the ground and all of that. We're not trying to see a physical thing here. We're not trying to create a physical boundary, but we're trying to create a spiritual, a psychic boundary, a boundary that can attract and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, 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 repair. So, 
I would advise if you're using a rope, you consecrate it. Now, let's bring it to the African nature. I will get a rope, probably a white rope, create some herbs that is good for perfection. Like, for instance, I could use a simple thing like this. I could use a basil, basil leaf, uh, turmeric, and sea salt. These three is okay. I could add any other ones if I feel like, but will I just take this? Simple three ingredients as, as an example. You know, it works even when you use only these three. You boil this thing, you make a, uh, your, an infusion of these herbs, then you soak the, the, the rope inside it, the, and then recite some psalms, like, you know, you want to go into bit hoodoo, or recite some prayers, call upon gods, ancestors, spirit guides, and whatnot to bless it, and give it a purpose, an intention, a direction. This is all applicable. In the Golden Dawn, we use those words, you know, by, you know, directing your, your walking, directing the spirit, giving the charge to what you want that thing to do. So by the time you do it this way, this, the, 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 uh, the, the cord or the rope takes up a form. It becomes spiritually infused. And then when you dry it, maybe under the sun or under the moon, depending on your ideology of trying to attract the celestial nature into it, then you use it to spread around yourself. It becomes a psychic boundary around you, not just an everyday, you know, drop and stuff like that out there. Now, there are ways you can also do. You could create a, a, a rope, like uh, use a, a cloth and sew it into like a porch, but not really like a porch per se, but something that will have um, an opening inside. And will be lengthy as 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 you uh, the size you want. Then you stuck inside of it. You know you stuck inside of that uh, that cloth or something with herbs, with dry herbs. You could write some psalms relating relating to protection and stuff like that. You could you literally use the psalms used in consecrating uh, Solomonic cycles and whatnot. You write them, you burn them to ashes, you add them to herbs, you put some salt, and you put like um. Uh, or what I call uh, red brick dust, which is also very good for perfection. You stop all of that inside, and then you lock it up. All you need to do is just to carry this ring, this cloth, and form a ring around yourself, and gives you the protection. And that's it. So there are ways. There, are, there was a time I also created a circle, like a belt. And this brings up to the topic of the lion skin belt we have in the Solomonic circle in the Solomonic tradition, rather. That belt, you are supposed to write the names that exactly what you see on the, on, the, on the circle. Those names, those symbols and whatnot is what goes on the belt. Why the lion belt? Why is he using it? It's like giving you, uh, and we also have the crown, the lion skin crown or something that you use around your crown. Mind you, that the tradition, I think the one of the that in the Rosicrucian tradition or something, we used to form a specific circle, a tree ring circle. We visualize one circle on our foot, like around us on the ground, one around our solar plexus, and one a little bit above our crown. Now, that is what the Solomonic tradition is actually doing there. The physical circle around you on the floor, the belt, the lion skin belt around you, they're actually trying to create an animal totem here like bringing the energy of the lion, you know, into play. And this, I must tell you, using one lion for two belts, to my understanding, will not work effectively. But rather using one belt that comes out from this one lion because you're using the soul personality, you know, of the lion, of that very lion in that belt. I could be wrong, you know, take this advice with a grain of salt. Now... That belt, that well, Solomonic belt, uh, lion skin belt around you, gives you another fortification, another perfection, another authority. Mind you, and a lion is also about authority. It's all about force, you know, commanding and whatnot. So that's what it gives you again. Then you you have the crown with some with God names and stuff like that on it. That also gives you an authority to command, to hold, to as a king over the spirit or something. So. There are various circles. All of these things, the crown is a circle. The belt is a circle. The circle around you, or around you on the ground is a circle. There are different forms of circle. 
So what you need to do, this will bring us to a topic that I think we will, want, we will be discussing on the show, talking about how to get your hands dirty, using what you have and what not. These are some of the examples. So I think I will rest it here. No, I love that. And you said a couple of very important things as I agree fully with you on the purpose of the multi-circle because it does not only bring in the threefold world of spirit, but it also, I feel that with proper workings, you're bringing the spirit down to our plane while rising yourself and your conscious consciousness up to their plane. It is It is a pulling down and a pushing up at the same time and you meet halfway. And as you said, the lion skin belt, I believe, is to bring the fierceness uh, uh, just as a lion is a fierce animal. It, it deserves respect. But you're bringing that specific essence of that specific lion to the operation. But you're also putting it around your waist as the second circle. You have one around your feet, one around your waist, and as Master Ross said, one around your head. You wear the crown and... Yeah, you know, Ars Gnosis, which is a great um, friend of mine, he has a co- company called that. He he makes different things for ritual operations, and he makes this awesome crown from the Solomonic tradition with the Tetragrammaton written on it um, that you can wear during operation. It's for the same purpose. You are a king. You are a fierce beast, and you are a master of this world, and you're calling forth that spirit. And that is very important um, to have that threefold consciousness when doing these operations. Um, I've tried, so obviously I don't have any lines available to me to make a lion skin belt. I did follow instructions from a different practitioner. Um, Arundel Overman, uh, you know, had put in one of his books about instead of a lion belt, he used a pelt of a raccoon. He said in the book, it doesn't necessarily matter the type of beast as long as it is a wild animal you're still bringing in and i guess in essence was saying the same thing we are you're still bringing in the energy of that animal and you know you have to write the names of of the entire circle on the skin that is a pain in the ass to do people he did it i'll give him credit i tried it i gave up um i couldn't seem to get them all fit it wasn't easy to write on the back skin of the of the of the animal i have multiple pelts here from from you know raccoon to skunk to different things um because i'm an oddities collector as most people knows uh, but to try to write on them and i need to try to get it at some point i've never been able to 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 be able to get that down pat now i do still wear the parchment with the the pentacles of of solomon on them whenever i do my operations but i, I have not been able to capture the the animal skin belt so if anybody has any methods on doing that that might be better and how i can get the ink to actually stay properly on it um please let me know Now, before we go any further, I do want to jump into a couple of our highlights of our sponsors. So we're going to jump into a couple right now, and we'll be back after these messages here on Knights of the Nephilim Radio. Knights of the Nephilim Podcast would like to thank our sponsor, Belladonna's Botanicals. Belladonna's Botanicals is owned by Jennifer Vatsa, a left-hand path and poison path witch, certified aromatherapist, herbalist, perfumer, skincare formulator, an incense crafter who designs and has created a massive product line consisting of over 300 products with new ones being released every month. Belladonna's Botanicals provides high-quality handcrafted metaphysical and self-care products including flying ointments and oils, herbal tinctures and elixirs, herbal smoke blends, ritual oils, powders, incense, radionically charged crystals, ritual bath products, fragrances, and bath and body products. Jennifer draws inspiration from the spirits she works with, and they often have requests. Anecdotally adding that as she was creating her product lines for the Dark Goddesses and Demonic Gatekeepers, that King Paimon showed up requesting his own product line as well. She often directly channels what they would like to be included in their products, in addition to her own ritual workings, along with known correspondences. She also has a popular left-hand path-oriented YouTube channel where she posts content on everything from podcasts with other occultists to her gnosis from working with different spirits and various topics pertaining to her craft and creations. 
You can check out her product line at www.belladonnasbotanicals.com. Again, that is belladonnasbotanicals.com. Or check out her videos on YouTube by searching her name, Jennifer Vatza. That is V-A-T-Z-A. Thanks, Jen. Knights of the Nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor, Aragni Arcane Services. Aragni Arcane Services is a husband and wife duo comprised of Baron and Baronessa Aragni. With over 40 years of practical experience, they are masters of the occult arts through various practices and paradigms, such as necromancy, high magic, black witchcraft, and more. They are published authors under their own publishing house, the Arcane Press. They offer books, courses, spell work, consultations, ritual tools, and more. All of their products are handmade of the highest quality material and empowered through ancient rites. If you wish to know more about them or their business, or you require their services, please feel free to contact them at aragnearcaneservices.com. That is aragne, A-R-A-I-G-N-E-E, arcaneservices.com. And if you use promo code K-O-T-N, you will get 10% off of your overall order or purchase as a special highlight of them being a sponsor of the show. Thank you so much, guys. Knights of the Nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor, the Telemancer. Let me first tell you a little bit about their owner, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about them. James Hunter Ralston has been a member of the Order of the Voltec, starting in 2008 and progressing through several degrees, last serving as head of the Outer Order. The Order of the Voltec is an offshoot of a pylon of the Temple of Set, originated to study and practice several forms of the sorcerous methods centering on techniques used by Mexican and other Central American priests and magicians. Many of the techniques involved were popularized in the late 1970s and 80s by Carlos Castaneda. Over the decades since his first experience with magic, his desire has grown into the creation and use of what other shamanic sorcerers term as power objects, talismans, amulets, totems, and other powerful objects. His interests expanded to the degree that he chose to become an apprentice of several Appalachia's premier craftspeople and learn the art of metalcraft to produce power objects for both himself and select patrons. He does work with gold, pewter, silver, and sometimes other metals as well. He has been doing this for over eight years. He does create talismans, pendants, rings, altarpieces, and more, almost all exclusively by custom commission. And you can check out his stunning work at facebook.com backslash the telemancer one. Again, that is facebook.com backslash the telemancer one. All as one word. Thank you so much. All right, guys, we're back on Knights of the Nephilim Radio, and for the last hour and about 15 minutes, we have been spending time getting to know and talking deep thought information on ritual magic with the one and only Da Lumin Ra, and uh, we've been very excited to pick his brain, see his thoughts on ceremonial magic. And, you know, it seems like we're very similar in, in the regard of what we believe and what a lot of these sacred pieces of ritual really stand for and why they are used. Now, the second part of this, and I should say, if you've missed any of the episode, don't worry. Finish the rest of the episode with us live. After it's done, you will have the option of streaming or downloading it to your device to listen to the entire episode. And hell, even if you listen to it from the beginning, listen to it again. It'll be good for you. So one of the subjects we want to jump into, we've talked about ritual circles, the importance of sacred names. We've talked about a lot of different elements of magic. Now, something I want to talk about, because I think in the Western world we are trained to believe that you need all these fancy tools. You need to have, you know, this exact athame. You need to have this exact color of robe. We start to get into like the golden dawn side of things, which does have its purpose, and I'm not saying it doesn't. But I think people that don't have a full understanding of knowledge will read a book, let's say Israel Regardi's um, Golden Dawn book, They'll start to get into the colors, and I need to have purple candles, and it needs to be at 10 o'clock at night, and I must wear a red robe that has a brown sash. You know, all of that has a reason, 
but it throws someone for a loop because then you feel like if you don't have exactly every element you ever need, then you can't ever perform magic properly. And that is just not the case, folks. You should be able to work magic anywhere that you are with anything that you have around you. Now, yes, having the right corresponding tools and colors and things will enhance that. Doing things in the right planetary day and hour will enhance that. But it doesn't mean that you can't have results without it. So, Master Ra, if you don't mind, can you explain to the listeners out there just about that topic, how you can perform magic with what you have available to you where you are and still have powerful results and give us an example as well because I know you have some. All right. Um, Magic in general all falls back to manifestation of your desire. What is important here is Manifesting your heart desire, accomplishing what you want, is what magic is all about. Now, how you do that is not important as manifesting that desire. The most important thing is having what you want or what you desire, but not how you do it. That's one thing we should get clear. So you could change pattern. Like, for instance, you want to drive um, by five meters away from your house. The road is very clear. You could decide to drive by going forward or by reversing if you're good at driving. (laughs) All that matters is you have gotten to where you want to get to within that five meter or something. So either backward, frontward, doesn't matter. What really matters is you have gotten there and you have done your value, you, you know, you, you're happy about getting there. That's how I see it. Now, it doesn't mean, the, what I'm saying here doesn't mean that the colors were just like uh, the, you know, uh, Babylon Fratha here say. It doesn't mean that you know, the colors you apply, the color candles, the incense, the this, the that, the that, the gowns and whatnot, they are not important. No, 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 no. They are important. But must you be limited by these things? That is the question. And the answer is no. For instance, we discussed previously on the circles. We talk about different circles. Sometimes you're looking for this, but you don't have it. Go for this. You're looking for the lion belt, you don't have it. The raccoon, go for it and stuff like that. Now, magic, mind you, is all about experimentation too. Sometimes you experiment. You never can tell. It gives you the result and then you're happy at the end of the day. That's what matters. So don't be limited by what you have and what you don't have. If our phobias in the African tradition, the the, 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 the wise Africans, the wise ancient men and women who form this tradition called Kuru today, if they were limited by what they have and what we don't have, I believe strongly that what we call Kuru today would not have come to existence. But they were not limited. They used whatever they have at hand. Kuru was not expensive. Kuru was all about the things you can have around you, the things you have in your kitchen, the things you could grow at the back door, you know, and that's it. The bones you can, you know, the, the chicken bones you eat, you know, that, that is uh, left over from your meal and stuff like that. It's what you use. So it's not something that is so, that you should be limited. That's, that's what I want to get clear to you guys here. So don't be limited from what you have and what you don't have. Get your hands dirty. Get whatever you have doing. For instance, you're looking for a planetary hour that is uh, a planetary day. Like, for instance, you're looking for the day and hour of Jupiter, and you don't have it. Or maybe your schedule is not meet up that day. Would you have to wait till you get there? No. You could look into what you want to do with Jupiter. For instance, when you book money and whatnot, you could go on some, maybe that day is on Sunday. You pick up the day, the hour of Jupiter on Sunday, and you see an act of ritual. It gives you the result. 
And then you could apply the element into the uh, the planetary nature, the, 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 the Jupiter, Sun, and all of that. They are planets. Now, how do you bring in the, the elements? You first the not the not as some people is all about bringing money. Sometimes the West also is also used in terms of bringing money. Sometimes the East. So you you based on how it what was it, the direction I was with you, you could face that direction direction and also attract that energy. Or if you know the specific angle that Jupiter is on the sky, you could face that direction and conjure up Jupiter and you get results. So don't be limited by the day and hour. Now, for instance, you don't have a black candle and what not to perform a specific ritual. You want to do a ritual to reverse or what so. You could turn up to a white candle and use it. You get the same result. Like, for instance, you're looking for a gold candle. You don't have it. You could switch to an orange candle or a yellow candle. It gives you the same perfect result. So there are ways that you can do it. For instance, you want to enact love ritual and you're looking for a red candle. You don't have it. You could switch to a green candle, which is also a color of Venus, and you still get the same, you know, the same uh, result. The green also has to do with the hearts too. It's not all about money. You take, for instance, you're looking for healing energy, and you're looking for a blue candle to perform healing work because blue is generally used for healing and whatnot because it's actually with water and uh, and the moon and whatnot. And you, you could not have blue candles. You could switch to that white candle. You could switch to that green candle. It is also good for healing. So the whole thing here is learn your tradition. Try to be vast in your tradition. Try to expand your understanding of this tradition. Also try to learn other tradition and see how you can marry these different traditions or these different elements and symbols into play. And you can do it. You don't have to be limited by what you have or what you don't. Uh, that's how I see it. <laughs> so that's it. Now, for instance, I will give you a typical example of what I mean by these things. I've given you different examples, but I want to give you a practical example, uh, experience, not example, a practical experience that happened, I think, about three days ago or something. No, about four days, yeah, about four days now. Uh, a brother is also a practitioner. He called me, he's, you know, he's actually a professional that I respect, you know. <laughs> but sometimes uh, we practitioners limit ourselves by our own thoughts because we don't have this, because we don't have this, because we don't have the time and whatnot, or because we feel the next person can do better than us. Don't be limited by those things. You are a great person. You can do much better than I can do. You can cast your best spells ever. In short, the work you do by your own hands is even better and more stronger, to be precise here, than the ones other people do for you. That's nothing but the truth. Because you, you put in your energy, you put in your feelings, your emotions, they are all attached to the working, and you get a better result. All you need to know, do it, know what to do, and do it. Now, the, 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 the practical experience that happened is this. A brother called me, and he said, ah, there is a growth around the, the neck of his child. And he has taken the child to the hospital, not only is working and whatnot. He has tried things that he could, not is working out. Uh, he that he needs me to do some prayers, do some rituals, you know, for the for the son. Maybe he will, he has been uh, you know caused or attacked spiritually or something. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It might not necessarily be a spiritual attack. It might just be a medical issue. Maybe the, the hospital you might have taken him to have not been able to ascertain to it and get a result. But this is what I want you to do. Whether physical or spiritual, just do this. I told him to take a white chalk, a consecrated white chalk. Here we we'll call it Hindu or whatever. But in, 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 a, in, a, in a layman's term, uh, in English it's called African native chalk. It's a white chalk. I told him to consecrate it. Those who took my money water classes, we know the very uh, what I'm saying here, the chalk I'm, I'm talking about, and the spiritual energy involved in this chalk. Now, I told him to take the consecrated chalk. He already had that on his altar. Take that chalk. Just uh, smash it, and then gradually uh, uh, reduce it to powder form, on the floor, while you, you you crush it within your hands, you say your prayers, you say your prayers, you say your prayers, you say your prayers. 
And then, after he might have finished crushing that white chalk, he should just pick uh, a bottle of uh, rum, even if it's not up to a bottle. Sometimes we get limited because they said I should use a bottle of rum. I don't have a bottle. No, go with a glass of rum if you have that. That's fine. You understand? So, as a matter of fact, in African, in my tradition, if you have a half, glass, half bottle of rum, you're not supposed to lie bet using the bottle. You're supposed to use a glass to do that because it's half. So I told him just do a libation on the spot where you crush that all that that uh, native chalk. And I have to speak whatever you want. Call upon your ancestors, gods of the land, spirits of the land, spirits of nature. There are different deities that you associate with and whatnot. Just do it yourself. Libet, call them, tell them what you the reason why you're doing that. You want the growth around the the neck of the child to disappear, to go. You don't want to know how it's going to happen, but you just want it to go off. But that's what you desire. Mind you, this brings us to the topic of being precise when you're giving uh, a spirit a charge. A charge here yeah, means when you're telling the spirit what you want the spirit to do. Be precise. Don't be everywhere. Don't hit around the bush. You know, don't have many words. There are a few words you could use that would just channel everything. So I told him to be precise on his words, tell the spirit what he wants, and then Set the sand, and the sand, you know, the dirt and the chalk that is on that ground. Take that mixture that is already mixed with the libation and rub the child on the spot where that growth is. Do that for three different days. That will be okay. It was like, it's too simple. I said, yeah, the simple things is the thing that works more. Just do it. It was like, try and make some prayers for me. I said, just go and do what I said. That's what my spirit says you should do. Go and do it. He went ahead. He did it the first day. The pain from the growth reduced. The second day, the, the, the growth started going inside. The third day, it like almost like there is no growth. Almost everything disappeared. And gradually, gradually, as of uh, yesterday that I spoke with him, he says the growth is no more. The child is okay. So that is a typical example and experience of using what you have at hand. He was expecting me to tell him, go bring a fowl, uh, go bring a goat, go bring these, let's do some big rituals and stuff like that for the child to be okay. No. So <laughs> it's simple. It's interesting because, you know, there's power in simplicity. Everybody wants to think that everything has to be so technical. And I think once again, to someone who hasn't been practicing forever and has jumped on this this grimoire wave that's happened in the last 10 or 15 years, I think that that's partly to blame because, once again, it, it's really strange. They'll read these books of complex nature, like, you know, the Megaton, and they won't necessarily follow those guidelines to a T or even follow them heavily, but they will see how complex it is and think that all magic has to be complex, but no magic is resonant in the fact that it doesn't need to be complex at all. It can be very simple, but there's different levels of magic. And sometimes the simplest of things causes the most powerful of results. And when you were giving a spirit a charge to go out and do something for you, it's better to be simplistic in your requests than to be so so specific, simplistic versus specific. And why I say that is there'll be people like, I want you to make this happen next Wednesday at two o'clock. They start giving like specifics to happen. You're constricting too much of the possibility of it happening because you're putting up too many walls and parameters to allow it to happen properly. It's not saying that you can't be somewhat specific. It's saying don't go overboard with the specifics and limit yourself. Give the charge. Be direct with it. Want the result. But don't add so many layers. One thing I can give you an example of is money magic. If you're doing money magic, don't define how much exactly you need. Some people will argue against that, and that's fine. But just ask for gain. Ask for something to come to you. Do the rituals properly, whatever type of money magic ritual you might be doing, and allow it to flow freely. But if you're like, I want $7,000 
you know, within the next 30 days to come to me, it's probably not happening. But if you open yourself up and, and, and make a request that I would like prosperity to fall upon me in the very near future to help change my path and endeavors that are currently, you know, happening for me, you might be surprised that all of a sudden you do get $7,000. You weren't thinking of the number. You weren't asking for the number. Uh, Something just came to you. Yeah, let me come in a bit. Please do. Sorry, let me just come in a bit. Where are you, where are you saying about money, money magic? I'm a typical example of what you're saying. It's not a bad idea for you to be specific on the amount you need. No, no, no. But it's not usually good. Let me use that word. It's not usually good to, to do that. Now, let me bring an example here. I will first of all explain something before I give you what happened to me. It is good to tell the spirit that you need money for this. Like, you need money to pay your house rent. You need money to get a car. And because the money you need has a reason why you're needing the why why you need the money. There's a reason why you're looking for that ma- amount of money. So don't pose the amount to the spirit. Just tell the spirit you need money to tackle this issue. That's it. The reason is this. What happened to me was I knew my my wife two thousand and twelve. My wife was pregnant, and we we discovered we have to. Do a CS like you know, get our pregnant before she can you know the baby will be alive, both of them will be alive and all of that. So knowing that, about think about two months ahead of time, that that's what the possibility for a self delivery will be a CS. I don't I don't have the dime as of that time to fix that problem. Now I decided to work with a specific spirit. You know, doesn't matter here for them. I work with the spirit in terms of I needed money to fix the hospital issue, to, to you know, pay for hospital bills, the years and whatnot. You know, I didn't specify the amount. This is what happened. I didn't have the amount, the, the money too. Within the time frame that I spell out to the spirit, I told the spirit within this time to this time, I need money to fix this problem. This is the problem I want to use money to fix. It got to the time my wife was about to be admitted uh, to go to the hospital. When she was admitted at the hospital, I don't have a dime. I only had the money to like pay some few things, and I was still having the mind, the belief that one way or the other this problem will be solved because. It must be solved. Before I realized myself, I stumbled into a friend while I was driving back home. I stumbled into an old friend. I was like, oh, man, it's been long. And da, 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 da. How are you? I was about coming to your house. I tried calling your phone. It's not going and all of that. Long story short, I explained to him the situation I'm in. He was like, oh, sorry. We drove back to the hospital. I see some wife. It was, she was in pain and all of that. You know, he felt bad. He pulled out money from his car, gave me half of what I needed. Like I needed about, let's say, $2,000, for instance. He pulled out about $1,000 immediately and gave it to me. Now, I was relieved. I paid some bills, and then the, the doctors have to start what they have to do. Then he left. You know, he didn't discuss any other thing with me again. He just left. You could imagine then I, one way or another, I received a call, and then I was like, this is what I'm passing through and all of that. Help just came from various locations, in a nutshell. Help came from various locations, and I was able to resolve that problem, and I was able to have about roughly extra of what I needed, you know, beyond what I needed, sorry. So what I'm saying in essence is when you are too precise, too specific, you limit you know, the angles, the rooms that the spirit will use in manifesting your desire. So you could tell the spirit, this is what I want to use money for, bring the money for me, that's it. The spirit will handle it. They might not give you physical money, you know, but they will give you a means of resolving that problem. So that's what I wanted to add. 
Well, I like that because no, that is a that is a strong point. I mean, you can, as you said, give the amount. I often don't, but you you don't want to limit yourself in the regards that you can have it happen in the most unexpected way. And for your your case in point of what you you explained. If you limit yourself too much, that might not have happened. You might have, have missed out on bumping into your friend who was able to help you in this situa- situation because you limited the situation. But you allow yourself to be open. You can have something coming up where you know a friend of mine had a court case and they were they needed money for this court case. They had back paid fines and things, and they were asking for money um, through a ritual and. Instead of having the money happen for them, something court-wise happened that they no longer even needed to pay the fines, no longer had to worry about it. No money ever actually came. The entire need for the money vanished. And that can happen as well. And that's why you don't want to limit yourself because amazing results like that can and do happen. So it's just about experimentation and seeing what works for you folks and try it. Now, it's amazing, brother, because I'm looking at the time and it's like, wow, we've already zoomed through the hour and a half. So we're going to be running through the end here. Um, There's so much more I wanted to ask you, but we'll have to save that for another time. So why don't you tell the listeners out there where they can find you on the web where they can find, obviously, your courses on Hoodoo Solomonic Mastery of Magic, and and you can maybe lead them to that. And I implore you folks, if you're listening out there, you are ready to change your life. You are ready to take on a strong and powerful path, but one that will be demanding of you and require your time and energy. Then please check out Master Ruz Solomonic Hoodoo courses. There are two different tiers of the course. I have them both. I've read them both. I will, at some point, when I man up and do it, uh, jump in and be working and practicing every step of everything that he teaches. Um, I look forward to it, and I implore you to do the same. So why don't you tell us where they can check that out at out there, and anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Oh, okay. Uh, it's really a good one being here. You, if you need my services or advices or you have questions to ask me, you can reach me out on my email, dilium at gmail.com. The Illumin is spelled D-E-I-L-L-L-U-M-I-N-E, the Illumin at gmail.com. You could also reach me out on uh, Facebook, the Ilim Ra. That's my Facebook username. But message me privately. We could talk. You could also reach me on Skype with the same name, the Ilim Ra, and we could talk. Uh, you could also reach me up uh, via Instagram with the same, the Ilim Ra. So that's where you can get me for now. I also have uh, a Facebook group page that I have created for a couple of years right now and it's still growing. The, the Facebook uh, group page is called um, Pradical Hulu Solomonic Magic. You could find it on Facebook. It's a private group page. Uh, when, you re- re- when you request to join, please answer the questions that comes along the entry questions, and then we will approve you if you're qualified to be in there. And then you could read most of my free write-ups and stuff like that on that page. I have my books uh, out there too that you could read and get lots of information out of it. I'm also working on a bigger book, what I would call a go-to magical book for every magician both the high and the low margin, that you could do every day. You know, like I'm going to be putting my daily practice and some of my advanced practices inside of it, the simple things, the complex things in it. It's going to come out probably within the year or early next year, so look out for it. Uh, also working on other courses that will be coming out very soon, so just keep an eye. Follow me up on each of these uh, social medias. 
and you have an update. And lastly, but not the least, believe in yourself. I have a strong belief in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, no one will, no matter how much other people believe in you, it's not going to change a thing. If you don't believe in yourself, that you can do it, that you're a master, the spirit would not respect you and would not carry out your bidings. So believe in yourself, have faith in yourself. Know that you're a master. When you do this, you can do anything in this life. Outside of believing in yourself, try to vast yourself in the knowledge of your craft. Ask many questions. Do not feel that you know, your questions you want to ask are dummy. No, no dummy questions. Every good master will answer every question, no matter how stupid and silly it might seem. Because the person asking the question needs to learn. He or she do not understand what he or she is asking. So every good master would always want to answer that. If you are in my class, if you have been my student, you will understand that I answer your questions and I always want you to ask questions because it is only by asking questions that you will learn. So learn to ask questions. Learn to be curious. Learn to experiment. I will leave you with a few words. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother, for all of your knowledge this evening. Uh, I, I ask you folks, check out the Facebook group, check out his courses, pick up his books, and study them. You will notice a profound difference in your life if you apply these things to your life. Other than that, it has been a wonderful evening. I thank all of you for tuning in this evening. We hope that you learned something and have some takeaways from tonight's episode. I'm sure that you do. We do have many more episodes in the season. I have 10 more planned for season three. So obviously please tune into our next episode, which would be two weeks from now. That'll be on the 28th. We have Sarah Mastros and we're going to come on and talk about land spirits, talk about local spirits and how that is important to, instead of just focusing on the big name spirits of any type of tradition to also work with the local spirits, whether that be elementals or also work with spirits of the dead, which is very important and it needs to be done properly, but work with your ancestors, work with the spirits of the dead in, in the local graveyards. That can be very powerful. And we'll be talking about that on the 28th. We do have another episode on the 11th of next month we are bringing back my friend Kadrick Olson to talk about Viking magic and to talk about a lot of other very fun topics that I'll be announcing soon so stick around for that and make sure you check out our other show Celestial Oddities the Pair of Normal Guys podcast on the weeks in between um, we always got something great coming for you guys out there other than that Master Roth thank you so much brother for coming on and we'll be seeing you around soon thank you all right, folks, we're going to end with these sponsor commercials, and we'll catch you next time on Knights of the Nephilim Radio. Have a great and safe night. Take care. Knights of the Nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor, Goetic Impressions. Goetic Impressions is a company dedicated to the faithful creation of advanced ritual tools by following grimoire guidelines as closely and as feasibly as they can in the modern world. Follow them on Instagram, Facebook, or their website, GoeticImpressions.com, to stay informed on new projects and limited-time items that they roll out frequently. For listeners of Knights of the Nephilim podcast, you can use the promo code KOTN10 for 10% off of your overall order. Again, that is KOTN10 for 10% off of your overall order. And make sure you check out their Facebook, Instagram, and website. Once again, the website is www.goeticimpressions.com. Again, that is goeticimpressions.com for absolutely everything for your ritual needs. Fantastic items, quality items, greatly priced, quick shipping. Can't speak highly enough about these guys. Absolutely wonderful team, and I'm glad to have partnered with them. Thanks, guys. Knights of the Nephilim podcast would like to thank our sponsor, Limitless Liberation. I'll read you about this wonderful company from their owner, Elena. Limitless Liberation was inspired by both Lucifer and Belial. Lucifer has been with me most of my life, as far back as I could remember. Belial and I started to work when I was going through a very difficult part of my life. He completely turned mine and my family's life around, for the better, in a very short period of time. In return, he asked me to create what he called Charger for him, 
He showed me the designs, so I created the first charger for Belial, and Lucifer wanted one next. From there, I had spirits lining up with requests for magical items. Some are control freaks, while others just inspire. They are all so individually different, but every single item created has power within it. Each item operates on many levels. They operate as an anchor for the spirit you're working with, thus aiding easier connection between the two of you. They also operate like a power cell or battery, where they already come with an inherent energy to them, but they become stronger as you feed them and pull from them during ritual, as well as to strengthen your workings. Limitless liberation continues to grow to honor the spirits that we love to work and build relationships with. You can check her shop out at etsy.com backslash shop backslash limitless liberation. Again, that is etsy.com backslash shop backslash limitless liberation. Thank you. 